Hi, uh, welcome to the Max Weber interview series. I'm Nevena, I'm a Max Weber Fellow in the SPS department, and this is Sita, uh, she's a Max Weber Fellow in the Department of Economics. We're delighted to have uh, Professor Barbara Petrongolo, who um, is a Professor of Economics at the Queen Mary University in London, and her work specializes in applied labor economics. And this talk precedes our Max Weber lecture series where she will present um, about women at work, trends, current perspectives, and policy responses. Barbara, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, we prepared uh, several questions uh, that uh, cover a little bit of your career and uh, move towards more specific ones uh, covering your research and your views over some of the most important gender issues. We focused on gender because this is the topic of your lecture. We know that you do also do other things. So the, the, first, the first question that we wanted to ask you is um, a question about your own career. And it comes out of our own curiosity about uh, your steps, and your first steps, and uh, how you decided to become an economist and specialize in uh, labor economics, and especially on gender inequalities uh, in the labor market. So it would be good to know. Sure, thanks a lot for inviting me here. First of all, it's been a pleasure to talk to you guys about my research. So my interest in, uh, in labor economics dates back really to my years as an undergraduate student in economics. I mean, why I chose economics, it was probably a little bit an accident of history in the sense that I wasn't too sure about my vocation back then. And uh, I picked a subject like economics that had a lot of input from, say, quantitative subjects like mathematics and statistics and more social sciences like mm -hmm. history or philosophy. So anyway, I ended up studying economics as an undergraduate and uh, I became really interested in labor economics issues right away because, well, labor, of course, is a key factor of production, but it's also something that occupies most of our awake time. Mm -hmm. So major events in people's work life are key determinants of their economic fortunes, but also of their happiness or unhappiness. Events like finding a job, losing a job, moving jobs, and earning careers. Also, often for many people, uh, their job defines their identity and their sense of worth for society. Mm. Therefore, addressing questions in labor economics, looking at the way in which labor markets work, is a way of really addressing very important questions about the well-being of society at large and individuals. And of course, the gender dimension is a very important dimension of inequality in labor markets. So whenever we work and we think about labor markets, we think about why some people earn more than others, why some people have better sort of work trajectories than others. And the gender dimension is, of course, a clear, a clear dimension of this kind of question. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Uh, interesting. Uh, it is. Uh, I know from your work uh, that you work a lot on historical perspectives as well and uh, historical development on, of uh, gender gaps. So I was wondering, uh, what do you think are the major barriers nowadays to gender equality? That, 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 that's a really very, very vast question. So probably something that I would say is that uh, despite convergence in uh, gender earnings, gender hours, and roles in the household, women are still by far the main provider of childcare, elderly care, for example, and major tasks within the household. And this inevitably feeds into women's investment in their labor market careers. It feeds into gender norms and the formation of stereotypes. And it also feeds into employers' beliefs. And all these three aspects, of course, have an impact on the realized sort of female career in the labor market. So I think there is a lot to learn from, say, the, the, the role of women in households and in societies as the main providers of certain services, services within the household. Uh, now, policy intervention in this particular domain is kind of tricky. So often economists or politicians advocate uh, mother's friendly policies, for example, like maternal leave or also part-time jobs, work flexibility. And indeed, evidence shows that this kind of intervention may help women reconcile motherhood with careers. But at the same time, this kind of policies targeted at mothers, predominantly targeted at mothers, they also may reinforce women's role as the main provider of home production, they may reinforce stereotypes. So it's not really clear that in the long run, intervention like maternity leave extensions can really help female labor market attachment. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Another kind of policies that is often debated is the introduction of gender quotas or positive discriminations in the workplace. So in, in that case, indeed, there is some evidence that, not, I mean, not completely clear cut evidence, but there is at least some elements that show that exposure to working women, especially in leadership positions, may help the evolution of gender norms. Mm -hmm. But this is, of course, a very, very slow process. Mm -hmm. process. Do you think that your research has contributed to uh, resolving uh, some of these uh, challenges in regard to gender? So my, my, re my, my recent research has looked a lot into the impact of these policies in, uh, in, in the labour market, like family-friendly policies, what is the impact of female outcomes in the labour market. And indeed the conclusion for this body of research is that uh, policies like childcare subsidies, for example, or in-work benefits, they are more strongly associated to more equal gender outcomes in the labour market that extensions to maternity leave policies. And interesting, for example, uh, subsidies to childcare provision or state-provided childcare really provides a substitute to maternal childcare. So mm -hmm. in principle, that should weaken the role of women as, pro as primary yeah. providers of childcare instead of reinforcing it mm -hmm. as something like prolonged maternity leave would do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also, yeah, uh, I have in mind the model of uh, France uh, where actually working mothers are uh, reinforced and uh, they have higher fertility rate, rates than anyone else in, uh, in uh, Europe. Yeah, yeah, or so Scandinavia, yes. yeah, this is uh, yeah. a Do you? So, um, in your recent paper titled um, Gender Gaps and the Rise of the Service Economy, you have you show that the rise of services increases women's um, relative wage and the market hours. And so I'm wondering whether there are any lessons to be learned that can be applied to the developing country context from this work. Yes. So, indeed, as you say, my, my, my research was starting from a very clear sort of observation point that historically women have been overrepresented in the production of services, both in the market and in the household. Now, in the post-war post period, the very large expansion of the market service sector has, on the one hand, pulled women out of the household, and at the same time, it has generated in the market jobs for which women had a comparative advantage. So as you say, this has generated an increase in the demand for women and showed up in both their working hours and their, their, their relative earnings relative to men. Mm -hmm. um, this kind of mechanism is visible both in the time series within each given country, but also it's visible if you take a cross-section of countries mm -hmm. and you compare industrialized countries that have a much bigger service sector with industrialized countries with the smaller service sectors. Now, when it comes to the comparison with developing countries, in developing countries, the agricultural sector mm -hmm. is still relatively large. So when countries move out of agriculture into manufacturing and into services, then not always the relationship between the stage of development and female participation is monotonic. Mm -hmm. So for example, in rural societies, women work typically more than in, do in industrial societies because women work very heavily in agriculture. So in early stages of development, with the decline of the agricultural sector, women may actually exit from the labor market and stay at home more than they would in an agricultural society with the expansion of manufacturing and works in sort of factories as opposed to the households. Then when the manufacturing sector shrinks again and the service sector expands together with white collar jobs and clerical jobs, then female participation rises again. So for example, in many countries, even countries that now are completely industrialized and moved out of manufacturing into services, mm -hmm. in these countries, if you go back in time, you really observe a U-shaped relationship between the stage of development and female participation. So this probably can tell us something about the evolution of female roles in, in, uh, in developing countries. Mm. Um, so also, um, so given your research um, thus far, do you, so what areas can you identify that requires further research with regards to gender inequality yeah. in the labor market right now? Yeah. So what I think is very interesting these days, is really important these days, is to understand the, uh, the role of social norms, identities and sort of stereotypes if you like, mm. in shaping men's and women's involvement both in the household and in the labor market. Mm -hmm. And in order to understand this, one really needs to understand what is the importance of this kind of gender norms and household interactions for the formation of employers' beliefs in the labor market. So what's really important is really understanding the role of women in society, 
the role that is perceived by women themselves or is perceived by men or is perceived by societies at large mm -hmm. and the way in which employers form their beliefs about labor market attachment to women. This is of course important in the average because labor market attachment to women is something that is evolving over time and on average is not as strong as the labor market attachment for men in terms, for example, of accumulation of work experience, actual work experience. Mm -hmm. But it's all the more important between, of, because of course there is a lot of heterogeneity in the, in the sort of gender norms or sense of identity that mm -hmm. different women have and that different men have. So when there is this kind of strong heterogeneity, it's really important to understand the way in which employers form beliefs about the labor market attachment of the representative woman or representative man. Okay. 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 So um, also, given your um, research thus far and that you've written extensively on uh, gender inequality in the labor market, would you consider yourself an optimist uh, when it comes to the future progress of gender equality? <laughs> so, in a sense, if you look back at the previous decades, at the previous, say, five decades, there's been very strong convergence in the earnings and working hours and types of profession done by men and women. So this is probably a reason for being optimistic. Yes. On the other hand, if you look at the past, say, 15, 20 years, this kind of convergence has very much decelerated in many countries. Mm -hmm. And for example, in the US, it has completely stopped. It has completely come to a halt. So in a sense, it's not very clear that we can be very optimistic and simply extrapolate from previous trends. Mm -hmm. Now, the good news is probably that the research has managed to indicate a few public policies or even workplace practices that seem to be able to help sort of correct those factors of gender inequality. So I think mm -hmm. in recent years we have learned a lot more about sort of the role of policy and workplace practices. On the other hand, the not so good news is that some, some of these factors of gender inequalities, they may trace back to innate differences between men and women, social norms or stereotypes, or even inertia, inertia or prejudice in workplace practices. And all these factors are evolving extremely slowly. Mm. Mm. Okay. So that's okay. good news about that. So my <laughs> next question actually relates to this. Um, in your today's Marx Labour Lecture, you will talk about factors that hinder further convergence between sexes in the labor market, and you will particularly focus, from what I understood, uh, on uh, gender, uh, gender models, uh, psychological attributes of men and women, uh, preferences. Uh, so I was wondering if, if what you're suggesting is that these factors are more important and prevail over discrimination in the workplace. And if so, or if not, uh, what is the role of uh, the gender discrimination in modern societies? So the, 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 the simple answer is that no, I'm not suggesting that actually. So there is a, a relatively large and growing body of research on differences in psychological, psychological attributes and traits and preferences between men and women. The vast majority of this literature comes from lab experiments. Mm -hmm. So there are typical lab games that are played between mostly undergraduate students or subjects mm -hmm. that may not be fully representative of the typical labor market agent. And these games are especially designed to elicit preferences on, say, risk aversion, attitudes towards competition, or social mindedness. In this particular setup, it is true that women display traits that are more likely to, say, interfere with the labor market success. Mm -hmm. For example, they're more risk averse, they're more willing to compete, mm -hmm. and they might be more social minded in, say, games mm -hmm. in which a man and a woman have to share some kind of uh, uh, some kind of endowment. There are two big caveats to uh, extrapolating strong conclusions from this kind of experiments. One thing is that it is not entirely clear at this stage how much of these results can be translated into a labor market scenario with higher stakes mm -hmm. and different subjects and most importantly repeated interactions between men, women, mm -hmm. employers, households and so on. So I think that we haven't entirely understood how much of that can be extrapolated into the labor market. There are a few studies that actually look into sort of real labor market scenarios and the evidence that comes from these studies is very mixed. Mm -hmm. 
The second kind of caveat that I would like to emphasize is the fact that we know very little about the origin of those differences in psychological traits. Mm -hmm. So the typical divide is that is it nature, is it nurture? Mm -hmm. And again, the evidence is, is relatively mixed. So for example, there is a study of patrilineal societies and matrilineal societies mm -hmm. and comparing the behavior of girls between one type of society and the other. So in the patrilineal society, girls behave the way in which mm. typical stereotypes might lead us to believe, they shy away from competition. While in the matrilineal societies, mm. girls and boys either behave very similarly or bo girls are even more competitive than boys. Mm. But on the other hand, there's also studies that show, for example, that the level of testosterone that one has in their body is a determinant of their economic decisions, for example, financial decisions. Mm. So how much of that is nature? So I, 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 I don't think we, we really got to the bottom of that question as yet. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads me to another question um, that uh, is about the system in which we live now. Uh, basically, many scholars, especially family scholars, uh, are of the idea that uh, the system of work regulations uh, is highly gendered. Uh, favoring uh, male standards of career, male models of career, well, in terms of competitiveness, in terms of uh, uh, behavior, or, or working hours, uh, like the assumption of lack of family burden, uh, which makes it difficult for women to compete with men if their behavior, as you say, uh, actually is different. So the question is, uh, do you think that women should adjust, uh, continue to adjust to this male model of career without expecting that men change too? And uh, is the system uh, ready to give us a solution uh, for women uh, to uh, propose a model that uh, meets the demands of women and propose a new model for men? So you, you're right, actually. The, the, um, there is research showing that, of course, jobs in financially rewarding careers require inputs like very long hours, continuous involvement, competition, that seem to be tailored to the typical male standard or male stereotype. So research shows, for example, that instead jobs that do not overcompensate, do not over sort of remunerate this kind of traits mm. are more female friendly, so they attract more women and they pay these e women more, we more equally relative to men. So for example, there is a very famous study by Claudia Golding on pharmacist professions. So pharmacy, apparently pharmacists, are occupations in which there isn't a sort of excessive reward about long hours, competition, or continuous attachment. So this is a very uh, equal profession, right. according to the studies. Now, I think, however, that we should make a very important step back in these considerations and think about what would happen, for example, if gender roles within the household, I'm not talking about the workplace, within the household were completely equalized. So if these roles were gender neutrals, I mean, if men and women were undertaking exactly equal shares of childcare and other household activities, mm -hmm. then this kind of traits, like the long hour culture, wouldn't be any more unfriendly to women as it is to men. It wouldn't be any more detrimental to the career of women than it is to the career of men. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, it seems really that the origin of this kind of gender workplace practices is in traces process. back to the household. I mean, if there is symmetry in the household, then it's not clear why a woman should resent more a meeting that happens at 7 p.m. than a man. Right, but should we impose maybe changes to men, uh, enforce them at the level of the system in order to have also effect on the household? Well, then in this case, the change that would help is trying to ensure that within the household, the gender roles are more equal. And this is extremely difficult because while it is sort of easier to intervene with business mm. practices and workplace practices, it is a lot more difficult to intervene within the household because mm. a lot of that really depends on people's cultures and identity and social norms. Mm. And as I said before, these traits are extremely slowly evolving. So so right. it's a much more complicated business than just introducing part-time jobs or flexible working hours. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, you touched briefly upon um, policies of positive discrimination. What is your opinion about it? And do you think that um, policies of positive discrimination can achieve efficiency perhaps in the long run? So positive discrimination, probably what you have in mind is like gender, gender. quotas. Yes. 
So th th these are a strong distortion to labor market allocation because effectively these policies are equivalent to imposing like a hundred percent tax rate mm -hmm. to make working in certain professions. Okay, so th 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 this is a distortion. Yeah. Now this distortion can be advocated as useful whenever the entry, whenever there's sort of obstacles to the entry of women into certain professions. So basically the distortion would eliminate another distortion. So and this, w when does it happen? It happens, for example, when the obstacle to the entry of women into certain professions is on the labor demand side. For example, discrimination or men not liking women to take certain jobs due to social norms or identity. Mm -hmm. So in this case, positive discrimination can effectually, effectively remove those barriers mm -hmm. and bring women into professions where they were underrepresented. And the optimistic view on that is that the entry of women that were traditionally male-dominated or leadership positions, for example, in politics or management, may also accelerate the evolution of gender norms. Okay. Now, the negative view of that is that whenever the constraint to the entry of women in certain professions doesn't come from the labor demand side, but it comes from the labor supply side, for example, there isn't a large enough pool of qualified women for the profession, then in that case, imposing the gender quota means that you're basically only selecting from one gender, mm -hmm. so in principle, you're actually actually reducing the quality of the hires yes. and that is extremely bad because in a sense that reinforces the stereotypes mm -hmm. against women so one really needs to figure out which is the constraint in each particular case that prevents the entry of women into certain into certain profession and then of course is the obstacle is if the barrier is on the labor supply side mm -hmm. then the main answer is not the positive discrimination but is making sure that women in that particular segment of say the labor market get the right qualifications, so removing barriers to women entering into those qualifications before removing barriers to them entering into professions. Okay. Now the evidence of quotas is quite mixed indeed. So for the, there is a very famous study for India looking at the introduction of gender quotas in local politics. So basically introducing quotas for the presence of women on uh, village councils, yeah. and these indeed have uh, have induced a sort of positive evolution into male perceptions of female roles and female capacity into mm -hmm. this kind of roles and also have eased the entry of women in politics. And then for example there's other case studies like on this there's one study on the Spanish judiciary system, there is another study on the Italian academic system mm -hmm. which shows that actually having more women into committees that select hires in the judiciary system or in academia actually implied had as, as an impact a lower number of women being hired. So the evidence is very okay. mixed on that. It really depends very much on context. Okay. Well, um, okay. So given that your last uh, evidence was about academia, I'd like to ask you a last final yeah. question about academia. Yeah. Um, so as a female economist, um, what has been your perception of gender equality in academia? And do you have any ideas on how um, gender equality can be better achieved in this setting? Yes. So it, it's correct, actually. Academia is not a gender equal profession. So there is a, I, I, I can mention here a study about the LSE, about the whole LSE as a university, not just economics. Mm -hmm. And the study shows that there is about an 11% uh, unexplained earnings differential between men and women. So controlling, for example, for age, for occupation, like for the, so your status in the academic ladder, and mm -hmm. also controlling for scientific production, which is something very important, of course, to control for. Mm -hmm. So there is an unexplained differential of 11%, which, 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 which is a relatively big number. Now, even more striking than that, or, pro or possibly very correlated to that, is the fact that the uh, academic career, if you build an academic career from, say, your undergraduate studies into full professor, is a very heavily leaking pipeline. So in undergraduate programs, women are on average even more than 50% mm -hmm. of the total population. And then moving out of undergraduates into PhD and then assistant professor, associate professor, or full professor, by the time you get to full professor, there's only 20% of women in UK academia. So the, the, mm -hmm. these data are for the UK. So from more, from more than 20% to only from more than 50%, I'm sorry, to more than 20%. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the obvious question is, where are these women going? Right. Why are they exiting and where are they going? And this is something that it would be really extremely important to know and to figure out what are the causes and the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in academia, as in many other professions, probably information would be um, the key element that would help gender equality. So for example, it's extremely hard 
to negotiate for a promotion or negotiate for a pay rise when you don't exactly know what is the pay structure within the institution. Of course, this is, this is confidential, so there is very little one can do if they don't have the information. Mm -hmm. And the other very important point about academia, and again about many other high skill professions, is the uh, impact of mobility and outside offers. Mm. So a lot of wage increases in academia happen toward happen via uh, threat and mobility of outside offers. Mm -hmm. Uh, if women are perceived to be less mobile by potential employers, by poaching firms, then they would generate fewer outside offers at given level of productivity, given level of scientific productivity. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think this is one of the main issues about why women generate fewer outside offers than men. Maybe women at given productivity, they might be perceived less mobile. And again, the reason why they may be perceived as less mobile is because probably they have, again, the higher share of home production and childcare and sort of family duty. So mm -hmm. if the woman is perceived to be more likely to care about the sort of where the family lives and the organization of the day for both herself and the children, and of course a woman has more constraints to move from a certain location to another location. Mm -hmm. So I think that this in academia matters quite a lot. Right. Okay. My question is related to what just what you I just put uh, from, from yeah from what you said it seems that women are less uh, informed about the pay system. Why is that so? Because it should be equal between men and women. No, I, I don't think that women are less informed. Probably men and women are e they might be equally informed. Right. I mean, at least I don't know of research that shows that women have access to less information than men. It might have to do with the with the way in which female networks and male networks are built. So if mm -hmm. networks have different impact in the way, on the way in which inf information circulates across gender, of course this may have that impact. But I wasn't really referring to that kind of information, I'm more referring to the fact that if there isn't any such information for anybody, then of course what really matters is men's and women's attitude to sort of ask and negotiate and be okay. perceived as willing to take a sort of career move and change location and change employer. So even given information, right, men are more prone to ask and negotiate. Yeah, I mean. they, they right. might be more prone to ask and negotiate, or they might be believed to be more prone to ask and negotiate, so they're more likely to be approached by right. poaching yeah. firms, for example. Right. So in light of this, what would be your advice for early uh, career academics, and especially women? It, it, it's extremely hard to tell. So, for example, something that seemed to be relatively successful uh, in recent years is something that the European Economic Association has done and also the American Economic Association has done, which is implementing a system of mentoring mm -hmm. of junior uh, female researchers by sort of senior female researchers. Right. Um, this what we were all discussing uh, at the Marx paper. It seems, yeah. to, it seems yeah. to be relatively successful. A I mean, of, of course one doesn't know yet what are the effects of that, but at least the, the sort of applicants, the applicants to this, to this program, and also the more senior people who give advice, mm. seem to be extremely enthusiastic mm. about the effects that this, that this system is kind of having. Now, so, so, something that should be debated, I think, is that who should give the advice here? Is it the senior female colleagues or the senior, senior male colleagues or both? M my opinion is that it definitely should be both. It shouldn't be a system done by women mm -hmm. for women. It should be something as a more sort of a community uh, effort to work, uh, to, 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 to work female mentoring. Right, and what about networks and uh, mixed networks instead of m male or female networks? Do you think that could be a way uh, to... So you, you're thinking informal networks probably, or formal? Formal, and informal, formal networks, maybe more than informal, but uh, they seem to be the major mechanism of entering in academia in uh, many, many realities. So I, I, I kind of think of, uh, uh, of like male or female formal networks actually, the kind of world where, where, where we work. I mean, I, I, I don't think any of us has relied on uh, single-sex uh, uh, networks. They are dominated, especially at higher levels, uh, for example, mostly by, by male professors. And in many disciplines, uh, this is the case, especially the higher the level. Yeah, but in, in that case, it's more like an informal network. If you say, OK, let's take senior faculty in a certain department, yeah. in the sort of average UK department, the senior faculty is 80% men. 
Right. Okay, so informally the network might become more gendered. So again, the question goes back to why is there a sort of leaking pipeline from mm. when you're an assistant professor and even earlier on to when you become a full professor. So really to understand why are women dropping out of academia and really where are they going? Mm -hmm. Are they going to professions that, for example, are more gender neutral in terms of female presence? Mm -hmm. Are they going to professions that are more female friendly? Although to be honest, academia shouldn't be necessarily unfriendly because it, 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 it's a kind of profession where you're very much the master of your own work and the organization mm -hmm. of your own work. So I don't really see an obvious reason why women should drop out of academia mm -hmm. so much between, say, uh, undergraduate mm -hmm. and full mm -hmm. professorship. Yeah. Good. Thank so you. I think that, that, that's a really key point. Thank you very much. This Thank was you. all from us. Uh, it was a pleasure to uh, Thank you very today. much. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks for the, the lecture and uh, the masterclass. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.